daughter was scared to death, okay, she wouldn't leave the house because there was something flying over our house. We thought it was the end of time. When I regained consciousness, I was on board of this, uh, apparently on board this spacecraft, and uh, I encountered two different types of beings. We have photographs, we have films, we have expert witnesses. What more do you want? We can prove that these objects exist. We're past the point of proving they exist. The question now is why are they here and what do they want? Unidentified flying objects, UFOs. Are they spaceships from other worlds traveling through our galaxy? Or are they something else? So far, we cannot escape our own solar system. Our technology has placed man no further out than the moon. If we can't travel to them, can they be coming to us? The American government says no. Despite films like this, they say it's physically impossible. So they've closed all their official investigations of UFOs. That was a fallacy. 69, they claimed to the public that they closed the doors, and they didn't, because the document shows that they continued on gathering information. So that was an out-and-out -out lie. Under the Freedom of Information Act, some Americans petitioned the government for the release of top-secret UFO documents. These documents, they claim, suggest a cover-up, a cosmic Watergate. All we want to know is what's going on. We want the government to tell us the truth. The truth, some believe, is that a higher intelligence from a planet far beyond our galaxy has mastered a technology that makes it possible for them to do things we can only dream of. They believe that these beings are penetrating the galactic mist that shrouds and protects our planet. Some believe that these extraterrestrials' technology is so advanced that they might even have visited us long before the birth of Christ. Are there secret messages carved in the stones of the pyramids of Egypt? Messages that tell us of the mysterious voyages of ancient astronauts? On the pyramids of Egypt and Mexico and in primitive cave drawings all over the world, there are carvings and images that many describe as being of intergalactic travelers dressed in spacesuits and helmets. Early Romans wrote about flying shields, ancient Egyptians about circles of fire in the sky. Are these references and these drawings about spacemen or about the gods they worshipped in the heavens above. Aliens from other worlds with extraterrestrial powers are credited by some with having moved the great stone monuments of Easter Island. Others point to the giant circle of Stonehenge as being a sophisticated astronomical tool, only possible at the time if it were designed by others with a more advanced knowledge of the universe. And then there are the Nazca Lines, an alleged spaceport. These mysterious images, decipherable only when seen from the air, were carved in the ancient times atop a mountain in Peru. Many claim this was a landing area for ETs. If there were ETs coming here in ancient times, they seem to have lost interest in us until 1947. Then, suddenly, around the world, people of all kinds began to report seeing them in the skies above. Some claim to have photographed them. In the United States, the government dismissed the phenomena. They described the mysterious objects as weather balloons, hoaxes, swamp gas, and other scientific anomalies. World War II had just ended. A new age had begun at the Alamogordo Flats of New Mexico. The atomic bomb had unleashed an energy that some believe would take us beyond the stars. Reason enough, some say, for those higher intelligences who dwell in other worlds to return for a second look at us earthlings. They would have to look beyond the shadows of our mushroom clouds. They would need to know what our universal intentions were. In the years after the war, Navy and Air Force pilots regularly reported sightings of UFOs. Repeatedly, these sightings were dismissed by the military. 
One pilot, Captain Thomas Mantell, radioed he was pursuing a UFO. The saucer-shaped craft, he said, was moving at speeds unknown to man. He pursued the craft until his own plane exploded in midair. The Navy investigated the crash and attributed the explosion to the pilots pushing his plane too high and too fast. Others said Mantell was a casualty of an extraterrestrial attack. UFO proponents charged a government cover-up, the first, they say, of many. UFO investigators alleged that the government cover-up went into high gear with the Roswell, New Mexico incident in July 1947. Roswell was the site of an Army Air Force base 118 miles from the atomic testing grounds at Alamogordo and only 220 miles from Los Alamos, birthplace of the atomic bomb. On July 2nd, this rancher, Mac Brazel, saw something crash in a field outside town. Brazel died in 1963, having kept a pledge to the Air Force to keep secret the story of what really happened in this field. Brazel talked to only one person about those events, his son, Bill, now 60 years old. He told him that whatever crashed here was something he could not identify. According to my dad, there was a bad thunderstorm the night before, and the next day he was out on the ranch, and he found this debris. And he picked it all up in his pickup, and was talking to people, and of course there was some talk about UFOs. He was going to Roswell, and as far as I know, he got in touch with the Sheriff's Department. They, in turn, called the Air Force. Then the Air Force got with Dad and uh, swore him to secrecy, and they came out to the ranch and picked up this debris. Major Jesse Marcel, the chief intelligence officer at the base, was assigned the task of collecting the debris from the crash site. His selection for the job, UFO proponents say, is proof that the Air Force knew from the start that... ...it was my knife. I found one piece of what looked like metal anyway. It was not flexible, but it was as thin as a fall of a pack of cigarettes. It was that thin. One of my boys told me, said, there's something unusual here. He said, uh, I tried to make a dent in this metal. And he said, you can't bend it. You can't make a mark on it. He says, I took a sledgehammer and, and whammed it. I put it on the ground and whammed it. The, sledge, <laughs> the sledgehammer bounced off of it. When Major Marcel reported his findings to officials back at the base, they issued a startling press release they had a flying saucer. The next day, Major Marcel was assigned to take the remains of the crashed objects to Wright Field in Ohio for further examination. However, the plane landed at Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas. General Alfred Ramey took one piece of the object off the plane and called a press conference. Then, Major Marcel was given different orders by Ramey. He was not to continue on to Wright Field. He told me not to say anything. He says, I'll handle it from now on. And that's exactly what he did. When he came out, he said, he told uh, the press that was there, he said, uh, that was nothing but a weather balloon, crashed weather balloon. Marcel, under orders not to say what he believed, only recently spoke out against the Air Force's revised story. It was definitely not a weather balloon. And uh, it was an aircraft. So what it could have been, I wouldn't know. I still don't know. Mac Brazel, who had a rancher's knowledge of such things, told his son that, like Major Marcel, he knew the object was not a weather balloon. He said that's what the Air Force tried to make him believe, that it was a weather balloon. And he said, Bill, he said it was not a weather balloon. He said, I don't know what it was. But he said it was something altogether different and much bigger. The if extraterrestrials are... Philip Klaus, the military expert, disagrees. The fact of the matter is that it was not a weather balloon as such. It used a weather balloon as a vehicle. But what it was is called a radar corner reflector. It's an object that is roughly hexagonal so that it can be tracked by radar. And no matter what angle this 
hexagonal thing is pointing, it always returns a strong radar echo. So the object was not a weather balloon as such, but it used a weather balloon to hoist it. If the object were only a weather balloon, UFO proponents say, then why did the Air Force pledge Mac Brazel to secrecy? And why did the Air Force pursue his son in the months that followed? Only 22 years old at the time, Bill could not help but be intrigued by his dad's discovery of the strange materials in this field. He searched for and found some remnants of the crashed object. And I was talking about it. I went into Corona and I was sitting there in a beer joint and I, of course, my friends was asking me if I'd found any more or anything like this. And I said, well, I picked up a few scraps. Uh, about a cigar box full, and uh, somebody, I don't know, must have informed the Air Force because first thing I know, I have visitors, and they say they'd like to have this material. And they didn't tell me they'd confiscate it, they just said, well, like we're going to have it one way or the other, you know. What Bill and his father found was taken to what is now called Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Some believe, however, that much more was taken there. What they say is the actual shell of a spacecraft. This spacecraft, they allege, was struck by lightning, causing pieces of it to fall away into Mac Brazel's field. The craft itself, they say, crashed 78 miles away. The story has it that the spacecraft and the bodies of its alien crew members were then taken to Wright Field and stored in Hangar 18 myth or fact the air force denies the existence of craft or et bodies nothing has surfaced in the freedom of information act released top secret government documents nothing to support what some claim is this actual photo of an et's arm the air force also denies the existence of hangar 18 itself senator barry goldwater has written that he has tried to gain access to the legendary building in letters to UFO proponents, Goldwater enigmatically says that he has given up trying to solve the mystery. Not because he's satisfied with what he hears, but because it's just impossible to get anything on it. Nuclear physicist Stanton Freeman, however, believes the evidence is there. There's just no question at all in my mind that a saucer did crash, that bodies were found by the government, that the saucer itself was picked up by the government and carted off for study. Uh, the tremendous potential for gaining new technology from a thing is, is just enormous, and no government would be foolish enough to put it on display instead of carting it off to the laboratory. Look, it's one of these situations of where if I were a freelance writer or, or I'd like to make a story, I would love this story. It's great. It's, it would make good copy. But unfortunately, or fortunately, I happen to be a scientist, and I have, you might say, the Hippocratic oath of a scientist. I will not say something is so until I'm very certain in my own mind that it is. So as far as the creatures are concerned, I honestly don't know. Dr. Hynek, a noted astronomer from Harvard and Northwestern Universities, has been a persistent investigator of UFO cases. In 1952, he was asked by the Air Force to join Project Blue Book, their UFO investigation unit. Seventeen years later, he joined Air Force Secretary Harold Brown at a press conference to announce the team's conclusions. None of the evidence that I have examined would indicate any proof at all uh, that we are being visited by extraterrestrials. What is the Air Force hiding in this investigation? We have not been hiding anything. The investigations have been made public. The explanations of those where there is a clear explanation have been made public. The hearing this morning was public for just that reason. Project Blue Book was activated to deal with what the media was calling flying saucer hysteria. They investigated 12,518 sightings. They could not explain 701 of them. Doubts lingered long past the report's publication. Even supporters of the project's conclusions had to wonder about photographs like these. In a series of three pictures, one can judge relative size because of the car window, the telephone poles, and the highway. One can also speculate about the dirt being kicked up into the air. Dr. Hynek, the leading scientist on the Blue Book panel, began to have doubts. He personally went to Brazil to talk to the man who took these pictures. 
He discussed the matters with the president of Brazil and with photo analysts on both continents. By 1973, he had completely reevaluated his Blue Book experiences. He now became a critic of the investigation and an advocate for more UFO study. I was there at Blue Book, and I know the, the, the job they had. Uh, they were told not to excite the public. Uh, don't uh, rock the boat. Uh, and I saw it in my own eyes happen that whenever a case happened that they could explain, which is quite a few, they made point of that and, and let that out to the media. Things that, the, the cases that were very difficult to explain, they would jump the handsprings to keep the, the media away from it. For their, they had a job to do, uh, to, whether rightfully or wrongly, to keep the public from getting excited. Heinick's concession that it was possible that extraterrestrials were visiting us raised the UFO debate to another level. A major establishment astronomer and a man trusted by the Air Force was now saying that intergalactic spacecraft could be traveling through our solar system. His pronouncements caused scientists who might otherwise have stayed out of the UFO debate to enter it. They called Heinick's proposition fantasy. But if we just think of our own galaxy, you know, it's 100,000 light years across. That means to travel from one side of that galaxy to another side, to the other extreme edge, would take you 100,000 years if you traveled at the speed of light. Now, there's very good evidence that nothing travels faster than the speed of light. I mean, it seems to be the ultimate speed limit in the universe. If, however, uh, aliens know something we don't, suppose they are able to um, trans transform space and time or manipulate space and time in some way, or uh, travel in other dimensions, then all things are possible. As man has entered the space age, the concept that all things are possible has indeed become part of a new way of thinking. Some of the men who investigated Blue Book were born before the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk. They conducted their investigation before man flew faster than the speed of sound. Even the men who flew our space missions concede unusual experiences that they cannot explain. Astronauts like James McDivitt on Gemini 4 and Ed White have reported seeing unidentified flying objects in space. Pete Conrad on Gemini 11 in 1966 is another of the 11 astronauts who have seen UFOs on NASA space flights. Some of these objects the astronauts saw were photographed. NASA has called some of these sun flares or space debris. Some are still labeled unidentified. Astronaut Gordon Cooper was so impressed with an unidentified flying object he saw that he wrote about it to a special United Nations Commission studying the phenomena. He wrote, I believe these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets, which obviously are a lot more technically advanced than we are here on Earth. Recently, Cooper reversed himself. He does not now believe that what he saw was an extraterrestrial spacecraft. Another of the original Mercury 7 astronauts, however, has not changed his mind about what he saw on a test pilot flight in 1952. Deke Slayton. As I closed on this thing, why well, it didn't look like a, a weather balloon, and that's what I presumed it was. And I had plenty of gas and time, so I decided I'd just come back around and make a, make a pass on it. And, uh, I got around where I should have been coming back on this thing, all of a sudden it didn't look like a balloon anymore. It looked like a, a saucer sitting on edge, about a 45 degree angle. I didn't have any gun camera film on board, unfortunately, or I'd have shot some pictures of it. And about that time, I guess what, whatever it was, for whatever reason, it took off climbing at about a 45 degree angle and, and just accelerated and disappeared. And I, I obviously couldn't follow it with an old piston engine fighter. So uh, I turned around and went home. Some UFO observers, however, have had camera and film on hand at the critical moment. This footage was shot from a helicopter off Catalina Island in 1966. Some say this is a single-wing aircraft. 
This film was shot by the coach of the Great Falls, Montana minor league baseball team in 1950. The Air Force says it is a picture of two aircraft. This film was shot by a newsreel unit in Guatemala in 1976. Some say this is also an aircraft. This film was taken by a Navy cameraman on vacation in Tremonton, Utah in 1952. The Air Force speculates that these are seagulls. Dr. Hynek disputes the Air Force's explanation of these films. This, plus his feelings about the eyewitnesses, helped change his mind. I began to get certain doubts because not so much of any specific case, although well, there were quite a few, it was the people themselves. I said to myself, well now, come on, how much longer am I going to call these people crazy? Uh, and when I changed my glasses, you might say, a little bit and took a view that maybe these people aren't crazy and began to realize what sort of people they were, the people who uh, would be accepted in any court of law uh, as a witness, let's say, uh, good, solid people, I said to myself, well, the time has come to maybe change my attitude. It was Heineck who coined the expressions close encounters of the first, second, and third kinds. A close encounter of the first kind is one that centers upon a visual sighting. Heineck investigated first kind encounters in 1983 in New York State. Local residents and commuters just 40 miles from New York City had been reporting sightings of an unusual object in the night skies for over a year and a half. Sightings were reported on at least 50 separate nights during the 18-month period. Over 9,000 eyewitnesses, lawyers, teachers, CPAs, advertising executives, nurses, and factory workers reported seeing the unidentified phenomena. Newspapers and television almost weekly carried reports of the sightings. From different places throughout the area, eyewitnesses all reported seeing the same thing. I looked up and right over my head, virtually, and it wasn't far off, it was right over my head and very still, uh, there was a rim of lights in the shape of a triangle. It was just a tremendous object. It was anywhere from wingtip to wingtip, about four, uh, 50 or 60 yards. These were very, very unusual lights. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And so I pulled my car over and I had to take a look. I mean, he would drive down the road and look up in the sky. Some people, like Bob and Lori Pazioli, were determined to film the object. And then one night, he spotted this one round object. And that's when he called me and he said, quick, let's get the camera. And we did. Oh, good God. I don't know. Not quite. I'll, I'll be t I'm going to tell you something, honey. I don't know what the hell it is. It's rotating. Bob and Lori photographed this unidentified flying object near their home in Brewster, New York. Bob is a vice president in a Manhattan computer firm. Some of their friends and Lori's parents thought they were crazy, despite this photographic evidence. Yeah, it's turning very, very slowly. 9,000 odd people have seen this thing, or whatever it is, and they all just can't be crazy. Bob and Lori have two children. They are concerned about what they saw in the sky. They also wonder why the government hasn't investigated the event. Their concern is shared by David Scarpino, an accountant who works in New York City. Scarpino, a family man, has publicly called for a government investigation. He and others, like Bill Healy, a meteorologist at the county airport, made this demand at a town meeting. Public furor has been led by County Clerk Dennis Sant. Sant feels that a government investigation is indicated by the fact that eyewitnesses have all reported seeing the same thing. You know, the movement was almost like a probing movement. It was very slow, and it stopped uh, periodically and stationary, where it just came to a standstill, and then it would move to an, another position, and the movement from one position to another was just extremely slow. Now, the speed at which it was going at that point was very slow because I had to walk at a very slow delivery gate to keep up with, just keep up the lights. Every step I took, it moved a little bit. It moved in a very straight line, very slowly. There was absolutely no noise. When I walked away from it, at that point, it started to rotate virtually, almost as it was on an axis. It didn't make a big loop, it just rotated. 
that appeared, as I said, to rotate in the sky, change lights. Aircraft, I don't care how well precise you want to be in flying those suckers, you're not going to be able to make them move 90 degrees. All right, this thing did apparently rotate. You can't do that with aircraft. Could it have been an aircraft or many smaller light planes flying in formation? The media attention given the sightings prompted six pilots at a local airport to try to prove that it could be just that. Amused by the idea of UFOs, the pilots planned and flew at least 18 daring nighttime missions, flying in formation sometimes without lights. This hoax fooled at least some of the eyewitnesses, but not Bob and Lori. They claimed that in addition to photographing the UFO, they also videotaped the light airplanes as they enacted their hoax. There are six, and the lead one has his three lights on. Everybody else only has two. Did you hear the engines? Some UFO investigators agree that many of the reported sightings were probably of the hoax. But some eyewitnesses, they say, were clearly able to differentiate between the hoax and the unidentified object. As it was coming over, there was a star in the sky, and as the lead light went under that star, right behind it, you could still see the star, which meant it was not a solid object. And as it was going overhead, you did hear engines. All right, now, what kind of aircraft engines, I don't know, but you did hear aircraft engine noise. Engine noise, different lights, and different flying movements, UFO proponents say, clearly make the airplanes IFOs, identified flying objects. But this object, or objects, remains unidentified for many. Some eyewitnesses refuse to accept the possibility that these are also the lights of the airplanes. I know what it wasn't. It wasn't an ultralight. It wasn't a blimp. It wasn't gas. Uh, no one's tried to tell me what it was, but I know what it wasn't. Investigators have subjected the videotape images of the hoax and the unidentified lights to various computer analyses. By digitalization of the images, they hope to be able to determine if the area between the lights of the UFO was solid, indicating one craft. The airplanes, they hope, would show night sky in the center of the lights. Physicist Al Hibbs. Pictures like this, uh, night sky, a few lights, uh, taken with a television camera that was perhaps being moved, act not deliberately, but accidentally, while it was taking the picture. There's really nothing you can, you can say about these things. In one case, there, a very good explanation is offered, and I see no reason to disbelieve it. In the other case, there's no explanation. I certainly can't offer one. I, I would love it if UFOs, if some UFOs were extraterrestrial objects being piloted by extraterrestrial beings. I, I think that'd be the most marvelous discovery of the history of man. I'd love to have that be true. So I'm not going to say that uh, objects, foreign objects, artifacts made by intelligent creatures in the solar system, I'm not going to say that's preposterous. I'm going to say it is so unusual, so Im immensely important, that I'm not going to assign anything like any sightings like this to that phenomenon without a lot more data. Insufficient data, the object remains unidentified. For government officials, therefore, it is of no consequence. But for the New York eyewitnesses, the question of what it is remains. They find the government's apparent lack of interest puzzling. The government didn't come to me as a rational individual. Now, as an accountant, I like concrete things. I like evidence. For them to say that I didn't see anything without really talking to me and investigating it, it means that they were trying to hide something. And that was my feeling from the very beginning. They know something, OK? They know something either they know that there's something up there and they don't they want to investigate it themselves and don't want other people trying to handle it or they're doing something but if they're doing something then let people know about it this new york state event occurred over a densely populated area and over a nuclear plant prompting one eyewitness new york attorney peter gersten to suspect a government cover-up with others, like Larry Fawcett, a police officer in Coventry, Connecticut, he helped establish Citizens Against UFO Secrecy. 
Fawcett, who says the way he views the world has been drastically affected by his sightings of a UFO in 1965, petitioned the government for the release of UFO-related documents. These documents, released under the Freedom of Information Act, were previously classified top secret. An example of some of the government documents we have uh, obtained are the overflights over the military bases in 1975, over Wordsmith Air Force Base in, in Michigan, over Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana, Loring Air Force Base in Maine, Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota, over a period of, of six weeks, unusual, unknown, unidentified objects were traveling at uh, exceedingly quick and fast speeds. Uh, what's interesting is that even to this date, the government has not acknowledged that it was able to identify any of those objects. The documents do state that there were confirmed sightings at all four bases in October and November 1975. The first sighting was at Loring Air Force Base in Maine. Loring, like the other bases, was a strategic air command installation. The documents do not state, however, that these objects were alien spacecraft. They do state that the military reaction was swift and concerned. At Loring, there were two separate events. Something unidentified appeared in the night sky above the weapons storage area. Larry Fawcett, having learned of the event in the released documents, investigated. Military people and guards in and around the weapons storage areas began to report lights uh, hovering or landing within the weapons storage areas. Uh, people would, uh, military people would respond to the area only to see the lights go out and the object disappear and then reappear over the runway. Uh, it's described as football shaped, uh, the length of maybe two or three vehicles, cars if you will, uh, the witness telling us that there are shimmerings of heat as you would see off a desert scene in a movie. Uh, when we questioned the individual, could it have been an aircraft? Could it have been a helicopter? The military person, and I'll give you his name, Steve Eichner, uh, telling us, no, I know what helicopters look like. I've been around aircraft. I work on aircraft. This is something I've never seen before. The official records, which I quote in my book, indicate that on the first night, it certainly was a helicopter. It was described as a helicopter. Now, if the officers on the base, experienced pilots, if they don't know a helicopter, and we have to depend on some GI who's not a pilot, who comes forward not at the time, but years later, he claims to have been there and claims it was not a helicopter. Again, let's go on the official records. It is the official records that Fawcett uses to substantiate his claim that helicopters could not be the explanation. The military response at all four bases, he says, was too dramatic. We, from our documentation, we know of pursuits that occurred, uh, scrambling of aircraft from Loring Air Force Base, and the chases went up into the Canadian territory, if you will, uh, only to be lost around New Brunswick somewhere up in that area. There's no question there were overflights of unknowns uh, sometimes referred to as helicopters, but if you talk to the people, read the official government statements, it's clear that they were concerned, that there were scrambles of jets to go after these things, that they were being observed by highly qualified people. Uh, we were lied to flat out about those cases. And as a matter of fact, some of the documents we eventually got clearly indicated that there were instructions to local base commanders, don't say anything about the sightings at the other bases make it appear to be an isolated instance. Military authorities will not comment on the 1975 overflights. They simply state that at any SAC installation, there would always be an immediate defensive response to anything unknown. Putting planes in the air, they say, does not confirm a penetration of an intergalactic craft. Citizens against UFO secrecy, however, refer to other documents they've gotten released by the Pentagon to prove their claims. In May of 1985, we've gotten a document that was classified top secret in 1948, and about a month after its, um, its release to the other agencies, its distribution, it was ordered, recalled, and destroyed, each and every copy. One copy was kept, and it has remained top secret, classified top secret for the last, what is it, 40 years almost. And in the document, the government acknowledges Back in 1948, the existence and reality of the objects. 
The official military position about any document issued before the Project Blue Book investigation is that Blue Book later explained them. This includes a startling document written by a Canadian. Wilbert Smith stated flat out in his top secret memo, and I think it was declassified by mistake, frankly, that this is the most classified subject in the United States, even more so than the H-bomb, and that flat out flying saucers exist. This is the opinion of one man, a Canadian officer, in 1947. For proof that flying saucers do exist, some critics demand more than just the accounts of those who have had close encounters of the first kind, visual sightings. Even when first kind encounters are reinforced by photographs, they fail to satisfy the need for physical evidence. This woman claims that she has had a close encounter of the second kind. A second kind encounter is defined by its having physical evidence. Vicki Landrum, along with her grandson, Kobe Lee, alleges that they, along with Betty Cash, were on their way home from a bingo game when they encountered something they had never seen before. The alleged event took place on December 28, 1980. Vicki and Colby were driving in Betty's car on Highway 1485, 30 miles from the Houston airport, and only 37 miles from NASA's American Space Headquarters. Colby Lee saw a light, and uh, he kept asking us what the light was. And he kept pulling my face around and asking me, Mama, what is it? And I said, Honey, I don't know. And. Uh, um, Betty said, I believe it's getting closer. And I says, well, it kind of looks like it, but we had no idea that we were going to get hurt. I would say within an instant or so, all of us noticed it because it lit up the entire sky. There was no way you could have missed it. It looked like the woods were being set on fire. And uh, uh, inside the car, it was so hot so my handprint is yet on the dashboard of Betty's car. They got out on their side of the car. I stepped out on mine. I stood behind the car door for just a second or so, and I walked toward the front of the automobile. I stood there for just a short time, I don't know how long, trying to see what I could figure this object out to be. It was diamond shaped. It didn't mean it was sharp up here and sharp down here. It was kind of round and the fire come out the bottom of it. But here was this huge object and flames shooting from it. And they weren't just small flames. They were gushing from it. And Kobe was hanging on to me and I he was trying to get, uh, he started pulling away from me, and I pushed him back in the car, and I got inside the car and put my arm around him and hugged him up real close to me. We thought it was the end of time. I says, uh, um, Kobe, don't be afraid. I said, if uh, you see a man, it'll be Jesus. And I said, he will come to carry us to a better place. He will not hurt you. It was just burning. It was just too much heat. I could not tolerate it. So Vicky screamed and begged for me to get back in the car. Well, I did, but I had to use the end of my leather jacket in order to open my car door to get back in. That's just how hot it was. And when the object lifted and slowly moved over to the right of us, her and Kobe saw some helicopters. There were so many of them, it sounded like a tornado. And we counted 23. I counted 22, really. But Kobe said, there's one more. And I said, yeah, baby, that makes 23. And there were helicopters on both sides and also over the top of the object, or like they were trying to hem it in. The only apparent proof the women have for what happened to them is the illness they claim they suffered as a result of the encounter. It is the record of these illnesses that made this an encounter of the second kind. My eyes were burned 
so till they would uh, swell and they were uh, tearing till I could lay down at night and the next morning my pillow would be completely wet. And I couldn't, I couldn't hardly see anything. Vicki was treated for burns and she and Colby Lee suffered long periods of nausea. Betty Cash was hospitalized immediately after the event. She suffered severe hair loss and was also treated for burns and nausea. Since then, she has been hospitalized several times. It was the first time that I went into the hospital they were treating us as burns. But then, after they found out really what had happened, then they started to treating us as radioactive burns. And since, I have had cancer. Betty's hospital records do not explicitly state that she was treated for radioactive burns. They do state, however, that she exhibited the symptoms similar to someone who might have been exposed to a radioactive element. Betty further maintains that she had no cancer history previous to the alleged encounter. Her records do confirm, however, that she does now have the disease. No, I'm not well by no means. I wish, I pray that I could be. With the help of Peter Gersten, the New York attorney for Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, the two women have sued the government to find out what it was they encountered that night. Was it a UFO or an American weapon gone awry or something else? I believe the story is a hoax. There is absolutely no evidence. The women's story is supported only by the claim of Betty Cash that she had serious health problems after the alleged incident. From my review of the Cash-Landrum case, I would say that there's no question that an event took place, that those people were near something that was emitting radiation. I don't think it was an alien spacecraft, frankly. I think it was a nuclear-powered aircraft. That's why all the helicopters... It's standard practice if there's a classified system around. There are guys ready to go there to keep somebody else from getting that should it crash. The facts are that the U.S. Defense Department investigated. They could not locate 22 twin rotor helicopters that could possibly have been flying in that area. And in fact, as Colonel Saran, who made the investigation, told me, he said, Phil, this occurred over the Christmas, New Year's holiday. He said, you couldn't get that many helicopters. You couldn't get a military operation into the air over the Christmas, New Year's holiday unless the nation was at war. The object was there. It existed. There's no question about that. What's interesting is that for the first time, the government has suggested that it wasn't theirs, that it was possibly a true UFO. And nowhere has the government ever, ever admitted, other than this basic document that we've gotten from 1948, that UFOs exist. I love this country and for all it stands for, but I wish they would tell us the truth. If extraterrestrials are coming here, what do they want? Are they coming here just to observe us, or are they making actual contact with some of us? Contact with an alien is what Dr. Hynek calls, and what Steven Spielberg has celebrated in the movies, as a close encounter of the third kind. Charlie Hickson says, He's had such an encounter. These things, evidently, they, they, they're coming from another world somewhere. Uh, I don't know what message they have for us or what, what they intend to help us, but certainly they're not going to harm us because they didn't, didn't harm me. Charlie Hickson's alleged abduction aboard a UFO in 1973 followed the story of Betty and Barney Hill's abduction in Exeter, New Hampshire in 1961. A most recent claim of a close encounter of the third kind occurred not in the backwaters of Mississippi, but in the heart of New York City. Rosemary Osnato. Suddenly I hesitated, or I couldn't seem to put the key in the door. And I just turned around and, and wanted to go up to the roof. And this seemed rather odd, because you just don't do that in New York. You don't go up on the roof at 1 o'clock in the morning. It's just not something you do. And yet I was doing it. And there seemed to be a very bright light that was shining in the hallway. And I thought this was moonlight at first, you know, and apparently it wasn't moonlight because when I got up there, there was a very bright light up on the roof. And then it went out for a few seconds. And then it came back on again. And I was just lifted, physically lifted, uh, in that beam of light. 
when I got into the, the craft, um, I was led by a group of, I guess, more than one, group of grayish skinned uh, small men or women, I don't know what they were, but large, uh, large eyes, um, thin, frail, and they communicated uh, telepathically. 19-year-old Travis Walton of Snowflake, Arizona, claims he encountered similar aliens in 1975. Walton was, in his words, zapped by a blue light when the spaceship appeared when he was working in the forest. When I regained consciousness, I was on board of this, uh, apparently on, on board the spacecraft, and uh, I encountered two different types of beings. The first type of creature I saw was about five feet tall. They uh, were very white looking. Their skin was very pale and uh, they, they didn't have any hair on their heads and they had enormous eyes. There was a, a type of being there that, you know, anyone else would consider to be look very human-like. Walton was found on a roadside five days after he disappeared from the forest. He could, however, recall only what seemed like an hour of time passed. Time, he claims, he spent aboard an alien spacecraft. Now 29, he reflects on that experience. I lost my job. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the effects were quite negative. You know, time lost, you know, it was a very disturbing thing in my life. A lot of uh, uh, negative publicity, really. You know, this is a kind of a stigmatizing thing for, for people to, uh, you know, consider you, you know, a you know, certain percentage of people think that you're wacko. What Travis Walton and others claim they have experienced has, according to some, now been validated by government documents. About to join the literature of third kind encounters is the startling tale of an alleged landing of a spacecraft outside an American Air Force base in Rendlesham, England. The American military admits they are still withholding six documents. In the Bent Waters case, we have an eyewitness, which is rare. We have an audio tape made at the time of the actual event. We have a government document which uh, corroborates the existence of the incident. The government has no reason to withhold the information. The UFO is said to have crashed in the Rindlesham Forest in an area two miles from the American military installation. Released Air Force documents confirm that military personnel were dispatched to the site on the first night. They reported seeing the lights of the mysterious craft. On the second night, after Geiger counter readings indicated increased radioactivity in the area where it seemed something could have landed, the commanding officer of the base, Colonel Charles Halt, along with several officers and enlisted men, also reported seeing the UFO. Halt wrote this document reporting the sighting. It clearly indicated the presence of a strange glowing light that illuminated the entire forest. It tells of pulsating red and blue lights and of the objects disappearing. Colonel Halt also made this tape recording at the time of the second incident. What Colonel Halt was describing that night, some believe, was the pulsating light emanating from a lighthouse five miles away. Those who believe that it could not have been the lighthouse quickly point out that Halt's report indicates lights of different colors. Critics respond that pulsating lights can play tricks, create illusions. And the light comes in at you at a roughly tree level. And it turns and it rotates, so it's flashing on and off. If you look at the, the transcripts of the taped account of what the colonel and his men said that night, you'll find that they were saying such things as, it's on now, it's off, it's on, it's off, if I remember correctly. And that sequencing corresponds precisely with what the rotational frequency is for the, the lighthouse. The lighthouse theory deals only with a close encounter of the first kind. What of the close encounter of the third kind? The story told later by several American enlisted men the story they say they were ordered not to tell. Afraid to reveal his identity, one of them talks about the alleged encounter. The senior officers seem very calm with it. And they don't, the lower ranking people like myself 
didn't know what to make of it, and almost maybe shock had set in because we were very apt to listen to what we were told to do. I know conversation took place between our base commander and the individuals that were in the craft. Our base commander at that time apparently even shook one of their hands. Something tells me at that time they had difficulty with the craft and we even gave them help in repairing the craft. The lighthouse explanation for Colonel Halt's report cannot explain away the account of the alleged landing and third kind encounter. And so far, nothing in the released government documents confirms such an encounter. There are six documents that the government is withholding concerning the incident in Bent Waters. I want to know why they're withholding that information. They do not have a right to withhold that information, and I want to know what that information is. The government will not release the documents for national security reasons. Citizens Against UFO Secrecy maintain that the government uses national security as a cover for withholding UFO-related material. Recently, they sued for release of a document from the National Security Agency. When they got it, it looked like this. When you go through it all, and somebody actually added up the percentage of the paper, more than three-quarters of this document isn't there. It means quite clearly that there is a cover-up. Anybody who says the government isn't holding anything back has to say, well, except for that stuff they won't release. I mean, this is a UFO document. It tells about NSA information about UFOs. Now, on the one hand, we, the government is still saying UFOs don't exist. Now, if UFOs don't exist, how can they affect national security? The government maintains that what is in the censored and unreleased documents is information that does not support the existence of extraterrestrials but rather information that, if released, would compromise our own intelligence network. Much of the information in those UFO documents the government claims has to do with how we intercept and decode Soviet bloc messages. To release them would reveal to the Soviets and other potential enemies where we have listening stations. My goodness, the Russians might discover, might discover that we have a listening station in Leningrad, as an example, that we had intercepted some communications there. Uh, more important, it would reveal that we were able to decode Soviet-coded uh, messages. There are three basic reasons why the